Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to Executive Director's Chat. Today, our topic is fundraising and visual storytelling. I know we are not on the regular Zoom link where I can see your smiling faces, but I hope that is good enough that you see my smiling face because we are both here, right? We're both here. And so thank you again for joining us for ED Chat on this day. Listen, I have some great speakers, but before I get to that, yes, you're on your own webinar style. You're not on the regular channel on Zoom. So we're gonna use our Q&A feature to ask questions. At the bottom, you'll see Q&A. If you have a question for one of our speakers, use that Q&A. Um, you know, the chat moves so fast. If you have a question in the chat, you type it, I'll try to grab it, but use the Q&A feature. Um, it, it will help us help you. As always, we're going to send you the video replay of this session, of this webinar within 48 hours. If you hear something today that you like, that you were like, oh, wow, I need to share this, go ahead and tweet it. I'm sure on Facebook, Instagram. If you need to use the CC button, go ahead and type this, look for the CC button right here at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, let me know. And today I'm going to go ahead and open it up for our guest speakers today. I'm so excited. Not one, but two EDs are here. Um, they love nonprofits, specialize in nonprofits. So I'm so glad to welcome Shanika Allen Lane. She is the founder of Catalyst Event Coaching. And she is not only an event coach, but she's a consultant. So she combines her love for events and education to empower others with the knowledge to effectively manage events. She was introduced to the nonprofit sector over 15 years ago through a nonprofit, and now she's a certified meeting professional that has that designation. So we're going to listen to her expertise while she empowers us today. And then after that, we're going to have Ms. Kara Todras Whitehall. She's an award-winning visual storyteller with over 20 front pages of the New York Times. So I know you're going to glean from this one. This is going to be amazing. Um, after accumulating over decades of experience working in the field. She started working with nonprofits and started her own creative agency. So I'm looking forward to hearing her tell us how we can share our stories through visual storytelling. So with that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and allow um, Shamika to share her screen. While she's getting that ready, I got one more remind you, you are on mute, everybody's on mute. I'll invite you on later. I do wanna remind you also that it is Cyber Security Month. I, I'm going to put a link to some courses here. Um, some of them are $10, $20, but I'm telling you, they are needed to help your nonprofit. Um, we can't, sometimes we can't prevent things, but at least you'll have a way to foolproof your organization against hackers, you know, people will trying to get in your donor information. So I'm going to put the link in there. And so we can be vigilant during this month and every day. So. Shamika, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. You're on mute. I, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Aretha. So we're going to dive in. I'm going to kick it off talking about fundraising today. And so before I start the presentation, I just want to ask you to think about your most memorable fundraiser that you participated in, whether it be event or some other type of fundraiser. Just kind of think about that for just a moment, what that was. Um, and why you feel it was so memorable. And I want to see your chat. So if you want to drop that in the chat, I did just bring it up so I can see it as you guys are um, placing in um, the chat exactly what those um, fundraisers are and why you think you remember that particular fundraiser. So if you see me looking back and forth, I am using dual screen. So um, I'm actually looking at um, some other responses that you all have here. And so just to go ahead and dive in as you guys actually put in what type of um, fundraiser you had that was most memorable. Um, that's nice, a documentary. Um, sure, that, that is a awesome um, fundraiser. Um, go ahead and continue putting those in because as we go through, I would love to kind of use some of these as examples um, as we go through today. And so I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off for you all. 
And I want to start with some fundraising guidelines. And so in the case of this, what I am talking about here are some things that you can use for any type of fundraising. It doesn't matter if it's an event or whatever other method um, that you're interested in using, but these are some good core guidelines to use in any case. So the first is being specific. And what I mean by this is specific to your ask. If you're having a fundraiser, you want to outline what your goals are, what you're looking to achieve. And so if the goal is, I want to have a million dollars, you need to be specific and not just generally, we're raising money. Go ahead and let them know exactly what you're looking for. And if you're looking for something other than monetary, then state that as well. If you're doing the monetary, in most cases we are, which is why we're fundraising. But if you're open to something that is in kind, go ahead and let them know those items too. Next, you want to be transparent. And I really stress this because how many times have we all seen a national well-known nonprofit that they're asking for people to make a donation and now people are hesitant because they don't know where this money is going, what it's going to be used for. They're assuming that maybe so much is going towards administrative costs. So you want to be transparent about what exactly you're utilizing that money for so people can align with what they're looking for what their values are, and if they have monies allocated for something special, and this aligns with that, then they can go ahead and donate it towards that because they're clear about what you're using the money for. And then next, Whenever possible, align with the mission. This is one that's close to my heart because you don't want to always have a miscellaneous um, event um, or a fundraiser that's happening that's outside of your mission. So you want something that makes sense. And so I'm looking at some of the comments that you all have. Some of them looks like they are aligned um, within those particular organizations' missions. And then there are some that aren't. Um, those that are aligned within it, guess what? It's a lot easier sometimes to go ahead and keep those people captivated because these are people that believe in what you do as well as what you're doing for this specific fundraiser. Um, so a lot of times people are looking for something that's outside of their mission to bring in. Um, this is where those questions of name some fundraisers, name 10 fundraisers that you've done that you enjoyed or you thought was profitable. And people are looking at that list, trying to pick from that list, but it may be something that's outside of their mission. So it may not work the same for them. So just be careful of that and just be mindful of doing things in your mission, because when you do that, it's now a program. It's now something that also is ser serving the community that you want to serve. And last but not least, is use your board of directors as well as your organizational resources. All of your members on the board of directors were either probably courted to join the organization or they apply and they had something that you saw could bring a benefit to your organization. So hone into that, hone into if there's skills or gifts or tools that they brought along with them, hone into exactly what that is and how it can help your organization, especially as it relates to fun, um, fundraising. As well as you want to do this for organizational resources, sometimes, you have resources in your organization, some that may just be free for nonprofits or anything like that, something that may have been gift um, by a donor. You wanna use those resources because if it's gonna lighten the load for what you're trying to do for your fundraiser, that's important because at the end of the day, it's important what you bring home as opposed to how much you raise. So that's what we want to make sure stays top of mind. And so I want to jump into a few fundraising methods. This is not a full list of fundraising methods, but this is just three that I want to highlight here today. Um, one of the first ones is ongoing services. And so I want to slow down and kind of pause and let you know what that looks like in case you're not quite sure. There's an organization that I'm familiar with that has, it's a financial literacy organization that focuses on the youth. And in their case, they actually provide financial advisement services. And all of their clients can actually go on at their leisure, book 
a time that is convenient for them and they will schedule a session. This is something that they're getting at a discounted cost as opposed to going to a professional and paying that price point. And so they're able to get this discounted cost with the information and the organization is operating inside of its mission, the information that they are giving to you as well as what they can take from a data perspective is something that they can use to show their impact because they're still operating inside of the organization's mission while getting funds. And this particular organization, I just so happen to know they've never done a fundraiser and don't intend on doing anything listed as a specific fundraiser because they're able to diversify their funds doing this and it's worked for them very well. So if there's a potential for you to do this method, you wanna go ahead and offer this if you possibly can because it helps to diversify your funds and you're operating in your mission. So it's a no brainer. Next is crowdfunding. This one, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're unfamiliar with crowdfunding is, it's essentially where you're looking to reach a large goal, but you're open to having many individual donors to get there. And so a great example of this is GoFundMe. Most of us are familiar with GoFundMe. And so that's a perfect example of what crowdfunding is, where they're telling you exactly what they're raising money for and how much they feel they need to raise to do that. And so that's the concept that we're talking about here. And so in this case, I have two categories that I broke crowdfunding in that I want to talk about today, which is peer-to-peer -peer as the first one. And that's where you have an individual that is already a supporter of your organization and you ask them to campaign on the behalf of the organization. So let's just say, I'm the person that is the peer. I'm supporting your organization. So Shamika can start her own team and I will reach out to my network and let everyone know about the organization and why this organization is, part, is important to me and the cause for this particular case. Whatever it is that we're specifying these dollars are used for, I'm gonna stress that information to my network and ask them to donate. So that's one method. The second one, I labeled this as special dates. Um, you might not find it listed that way anywhere else, um, but I listed it as special dates because it could be a variety of dates. And so I didn't want to just limit it to one. And so one of the most famous ones is coming up soon. It's called Giving Tuesday. And if you aren't familiar with that or you haven't participated with it prior, um, you want to jump on that bandwagon immediately. So go ahead and start researching about that today. Um, I'm sure you're going to get some nuggets today that could actually help in that effort. So please take some notes and do a little research on that. And so just to kind of give you a little bit more detail about it. Um, the uh, Given Tuesday is actually happening next month. So we're about, I think, 40 days out um, for this particular event. It is something that is globally recognized at this point. Um, and because it is globally recognized, there's marketing dollars already behind it. This is something that many people are already aware that exists. So you get an opportunity to essentially ride the wave on this particular um, venture if you want to participate. And so many organizations sign up to let people know that they're participating in Giving Tuesday, but you don't want to wait to that specific date to go ahead and let people know that you're participating. You want to start doing things now, today. You want to go ahead and let them know more things about what the organization is doing. And you want to let them know that you are participating in that and give those that are um, wanting to give the opportunity to give prior to the actual day because they may not be available the actual giving day. Um, and then many times people just go ahead and leave that open through the remaining part of the year because people are looking to make those last minute donations as they close out the year for any of their tax purposes. But it's not limited to just Giving Tuesday. There are other opportunities that are similar to Giving Tuesdays. Depending on your geographical location, you may live in a city or state or some other type of location where 
they have a recognized date that they also observe. So there are some cities that observe it. I know New Orleans here in the US actually has a day that's like that. And whatever that day is, many times they have a website with a landing page and all of the participating organizations are listed there. You would simply click to see what organizations are listed and you can go to each individual organization. So you want to take advantage of those opportunities because again, those are marketing dollars and things that are already established and being used that your organization can now start to leverage. You might have to put in some marketing dollars or campaigning behind it too, but you don't have to put in the full amount. You already have some people's attention. And then, of course, don't forget about things like your own anniversary or if there is a holiday or some type of recognition day that goes along with your mission that you feel that is important for you to kind of do something special on. This is a great time to also do a special crowdfunding. And then last but not least is events. I think most often when people think about fundraising, they think about um, fundraising events. Um, so this is absolutely my wheelhouse and what I deal with most often. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so for me, I am always trying to encourage people to determine the purpose of your event. So of course, we're talking about fundraising today that is obviously one of the purposes. It is the primary purpose, probably in most cases, but I want to say it another way today because the thing is, although it may be your primary purpose in most cases, don't wait until it's your primary purpose. And what I mean by that is if there's an opportunity for you to get revenue another way, take advantage of that. And I'll give you a quick example. There's an organization local that they actually support um, children that have terminal um, illnesses. And with that organization, part of what they do is make sure that those special times, holidays and different things like that, that children may look forward to, they may not be around to enjoy it or just may not feel well that day to be able to fully immerse in that celebration. Well, guess what? They make each of those days that day special at that particular campus. And so think, for instance, in December, where um, here in the US, we have lights exhibited in different areas and people want to take their families to see light tours and things like that. Well, they do that as well on that campus and they're doing it to support their people that they serve every day. They're supporting those children and families with terminal illnesses. It's already up, they paid the money, but guess what? There are other families that are looking for something to do. There are other families that's looking for the right neighborhood to go and see these beautiful lights. Why not create an opportunity for those families that are looking for something to do to actually come to this location and take advantage of seeing the lights that they've already put up, that they're already there. So they have a ticket opportunity for people to purchase and the prices are not static. Oddly enough, so depending on the date and time that you're looking to go, you may actually pay a different price for your ticket. So I think it's one of the most genius things I've seen, but that's another example of how fundraising may not have been your top priority, but you find a way to incorporate it in what you're doing. And so to just kind of go over a few others that I find that are probably some of your most common ones is also raising awareness as well as serving your organization purpose, that example I just gave did all three, if you really think about it. They were serving their organization purpose. That was the primary thing that they were doing in this case. But because they were doing a light show and it's something that's popular that time of year, they also raised awareness because when you go and you look in the search bar, you go to find what to do in the area, that's one of the things that came up. So now you may not have known about this organization, but when you get on that campus, one, you find out about it before you went, but once you get on the campus, they utilize the opportunity to educate you further about what they're doing. And so they've done all three. I think that's an excellent job. And then fourth, I have here celebration. This is a great way, especially if you're doing something that's a heavy topic um, to bring people in and have a good time so that they're not down and out, but they can still support the cause. 
And so I wanted to list a few event types because I know no matter what, people still often ask, what are some fundraising events that we can do? And so here are a few. We have a fun walk and run. These are things that are really great for health-based organizations. Um, competition, this could be for anyone really because it depends on what you're doing inside of your nonprofit. You can make a competition about whatever that looks like. Um, conferences, if what you do really uh, fits in line with that. Um, shows and exhibits, a really good example of this is dealing with, um, creative arts, fine arts, things like that. Um, a celebration event. Um, I wanted to specify gala in this case because that's one of the most popular fundraising events that people um, like to kind of lean on towards. And I'm not against galas, but what I will say is that galas have a high ticket price most often. And if you're able to find a way to get those ticket prices, um, not ticket prices, but the overhead price down, down for your organization, then this could be a really good alternative. But know that galas are not the only way that you can celebrate. There are many other ways that you can celebrate your organization. So, you know, you want to look at some of those things. It could be an end of year celebration. It could be many other things, but look at that, how you can actually celebrate. And of course, things like sporting events, um, but this all depends on the type of organization you are and who you serve. And so I wanted to give a few tips that really, no matter what fundraising method you're utilizing, that you should keep in mind. And so the first one is share the organization story. When you're asking for funding, that's one of the most important things. You know, I mentioned a few different nonprofits as I was speaking here today. I didn't tell all of their story. I told what they were doing. But the more you're telling the story, the more you relate to them. I'm sure there's people that you follow right now that you're following them because of their story. It's the same thing for your nonprofit. When they understand the journey that you're going on, they understand what your story is and what you're looking to achieve you're able to kind of get people that say, you know what, I can relate to that. Or I have someone in my network or a loved one that can relate to this. And because of that, they're looking to support it. You want to also show the impact of the organization. This is extremely important because they need to know what the organization is doing and really where their money is going if they're giving to you. So be sure to always show exactly what that impact is and what that may look like is your donation. We've seen these commercials growing up where you may adopt a child or something like that or adopt a pet. You know, you're doing different things and they say this amount feeds a child for this amount of time. You know, that's the type of information that is showing the impact and you want to, want to let them know how many you've been able to help because of what they're looking to do, or if you have a goal, how many your goal is going to help you achieve. And then you want to make it convenient. And there's a couple of layers to this. First, I want to say make it convenient for them to donate. And so what that looks like, if you do have an opportunity where you have a ticket that they're purchasing, allow them to be able to have a quick add-on for a donation. So although your ticket price is actually part of the fundraising efforts, you still want to give them the opportunity to give you more. They don't have to stop there. So if you have a $20 or $50 ticket, they can still do another way by making it convenient to have a link or a way to add on for them to do an additional amount. And if you're able to make that a blank amount and they can enter in the amount that they desire, make it that way. If not, and you have to specify, just make it a round number, make it $10, make it $20, make and add as many of the $10 amounts as they like to equal to the amount that they would love to give the organization. The second part of making it convenient is make it convenient to the organization. You want to minimize the resources that you're utilizing so that it's something that's more feasible for your team to actually achieve it 
and do it on a regular basis. So if you're making it convenient for your team, they're more likely to continue to do it for years to come. So make it convenient all the way around. Don't go and try to reinvent the wheel from top to bottom. More than likely, there's a way that this has been done before, even if it hasn't been from a fundraising perspective. And start looking at those ways so that you can actually reduce your efforts. If there's tools or resources that you have, go ahead and utilize those as well. And then last but not least, which goes right into my partner here today with Tara, um, with her storytelling, you want to bring them along the journey. And so what I mean by that is, if you said, my goal is to raise a million dollars, and you let them know what the impact is going to be of the million dollars, let's just even say you didn't get the full million dollars, or maybe you surpassed that amount. Letting them know exactly what's going on, where you are in the process, even after they've done this fundraising event with you. You want to take them along that journey to let them see that you've purchased all the items that you need. You're getting ready to go out and give this to your community. Whatever that is that you're doing, bring them on the journey because they feel like they're a participant around the journey and they have some stake in the game. And so that is it for me today. And we're gonna um, get ready to go over to Tara, I believe. Yeah, thank you so much. She'll be typing her information in the chat room so you can reach out to her and feel free to type your questions in the Q&A while Tara is coming up. Um, we'll be answering all the questions at the end. So give me one second, I'll be sharing the screen. Well, okay. uh, I just wanted to, before we share the screen, I just wanted to ask some, a question, right. um, which is uh, what, if you guys want to put in the chat, what you think of when you think of visual storytelling um, that I'm just curious, like as to um, people, what their, what is visual storytelling? Is it photos? Is it video? What else is there that comes to mind when you say, think of visual storytelling, photos that emote evoke emotion that's yeah um photos that have an emotional impact no stock photos yep brochures uh-huh i think of video um artwork live drawing great yeah those are really good infographics yes storyboard love it yep powerpoint exactly um people maybe animals these are all really good um these are great these are great responses because i think like Sometimes people get stuck in the idea that visual storytelling is just photo and video, and that is a big point part of it, but there's so much else, live storytellers, there's so many things that you can use uh, visual storytelling, like people said, infographics, uh, data visualizations, um, you know, illustrations, PowerPoints, social media, all these things are visual storytelling. So today, um, you know, Shamika had some really, uh, was, you know, a, my, very much in sync with the things that she was talking about in terms of, you know, being transparent and aligning with the mission and kind of just being really authentic. So on that note, in terms of telling your story, um, what's really important in terms of these things, I'm just going to go through a little, a few tips for you guys about what does that mean for, you know, um, the types of things that really connect with people and that you should be looking at for when telling the stories of your organization. Um, so the thing that the first thing that's on the screen about connecting through narratives is the first person narrative. Um, if you have an, um, a video that kind of has this over booming voice narrative that comes in and says things about your organization, it can be effective. But when you have someone who is talking to your viewer, to your audience, and is telling their personal story, it doesn't have to have everything. It doesn't have to have all the pieces of your organization, but if it connects on the emotional level that makes your audience want to know more, that is what you're looking for. So, you know, just thinking about um, the first person narrative and like thinking about the authenticity and what that means in terms of like how you want to put your audience inside the story through a person. And, you know, the first person narrative is like just about the emotions creating a song, like a strong connection um, when the person is talking to you. Um, so these are the things that you're thinking about when you're say first person narrative should be top of mind in terms of how you can bring 
a first person narrative into your organization story. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, so the, the next part of this that goes along with the first person narrative is about the identifiable person effect. And it was actually, um, it's, <laughs> the real term is called identifiable victim effects, but I think we have far surpassed that. And there's no reason that that needs to be the thing. We are talking about identifying a person in our story. And that goes along with the first person narrative but you know, it's about introducing a main character. And I really do mean one main character because there's been a lot of studies that show that if you um, talk about multiple people, even two, the um, connection to your character goes down um, dramatically within the audience. So they're much more likely uh, to donate, to get involved when there's a single named person rather than a group of people. So you want to create the, go with the identifiable person effect. So I just have uh, a short video um, to show you, um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, and you have to, I think, press the- My name is Ray Norton, I'm 18 years old. This is how climate change and pollution has affected me. One of my most distinct memories growing up in Detroit is going south on I-75. Smelling the pollution coming from Marathon and seeing the smoke and the fire on the freeway. I remember trying to hold my breath as long as I could, but eventually you have to breathe in. I've lived in Detroit my whole life. We bounced around a lot when I was a kid. We couldn't always afford to pay rent and neither could a lot of my friends and family. I know that the planet is on a path towards destruction, and I know that it's caused by the same people who produce the smells and the smoke on the freeway. Poor people, minorities, and young people like me are facing violence and threats in our lives every day from a system that treats us like resources to be extracted. So this is my old neighborhood. The, uh, the wall that separates Detroit and Gross Point over there was a uh, it was a big site for dumpers, like um, business owners usually would come and you would see them dumping their trash, their, their tires or roof shingles. So that's um, from the Sunrise Movement, which is about, you know, Men's motivating um, youth to get involved. And um, the, the thing about this is that there's, it's just a very real video. It's about his story. It's about Ray and his, like the work that he's doing, like he's talking about and he wants to change. Uh, it's just talking about his story and it's incredibly impactful because it reaches us on a very, uh, visceral level. We, um, you know, the things that we can, um, relate to, you know, growing up and the climate change and, you know, everyone has, will have a different relationship with it. But it's really, um, it's very important to kind of like bring out those stories. Um, sometimes they're not good. Sometimes they are good. Sometimes they're in process, whatever it is, but just trying to find those and really create, um, you know, the, uh, that kind of connection. So the next thing is, as is on the screen, is that another thing that's really helpful, a really helpful tip in terms of finding your stories is trying to uh, immerse your audience in um, a moment of tension in that. So when, you know, there's sometimes it's just really, it's lovely, it's beautifully shot. Um, there's that that's gonna draw you and it's really nice music, it's a good story. Or there's also the thing where you have a good story, but you want to start at something that is more kind of has a moment where it will make people kind of stay around. So just thinking about if you have an arc to your story, which you should, at what is the moment that you are going to bring the audience in at? Because it doesn't have to be at the beginning. A lot of people start at the, you know, kind of the background and this person grew up this how, blah, blah, blah. That may not be your most, uh, you know, the most impactful part of your story. You may choose to go in at the moment where something has happened, a climactic moment, a, a moment where something shifts. That can be your moment of tension. And that doesn't mean that you're not gonna tell the rest of the story, but you're gonna start there. 
So that's the kind of things that you're thinking about in terms of visuals. What are your most visual moments? What are the things that are going to bring your audience in to really tell your story effectively? Um, next slide, please. And then, you know, another idea or something that can help is like presenting a startling fact or a visual in that. And it doesn't have to, I'm not saying like, um, you know, we are under pressure with social media to kind of be these like extravagant um, images or like making these statements that are gonna make people, um, you know, take notice. I am, I'm not advocating that. What I'm advocating is finding something in your story that's going to hold someone's attention. So the thing that is going to do that. So um, this next video is kind of a really good example because there's nothing that's um, shocking in this. It's just done in a really different way and it's kind of takes your attention because of it. So uh, you can go ahead and play it, Aretha. My name is Abs. I've been working as a midwife for nearly three decades here in Liberia. I have cared for the mothers and babies with love and affection. Sometimes the parents here have a special way of thanking me, and that's why there are hundreds of children around here called Alice, named after me. There are over 800 addresses everywhere you go. Addis, Addis, Addis. <laughs> Seeing so many addresses made me happy and so proud of the legacy of the So this is from Save the Children. It's a great video. Um, and what I love most is that it's a very good story to begin with, but she's the start of the video. You don't know what's happening. There's all these Alice's popping up on screen. It's a nice visual. So it's kind of like takes you a second to figure out what's going on and you're in, you're hooked because you don't, you want to know what's going on with all these Alice's. So uh, it went from a good story to a great story because of the way that the visuals were presented in kind of a different, unique way. So just thinking about that stuff. Um, and then um, finally, trying to make your cause a quest. You know, as, uh, as Shamika said, your journey, you know, you are on a journey. There is so much out there in terms of like how you started, where you're going, what are your hopes, what are the obstacles don't forget your obstacles when you're telling your story, because it's so important to do that as well. Your quest is, you know, a real quest that you're going on is full of obstacles. Our real lives are full of obstacles. If we don't tell our stories with all the ups and downs, then our audience won't believe it anyway, because we believe real stories. And we, if we see like everything went from horrible to great, nothing in between, then you're just kind of like, yeah, this, that's kind of like a Disney fairy tale and it doesn't really work for me. Um, actually, Disney still goes ups and downs too. So it doesn't really, it, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. Um, so you really want to think about that in terms of like making your cause a quest and thinking of how you can bring um, all these kind of things along the way with your visuals to do this as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so just as an, as, a, uh, as an example of this, and uh, also from Sunrise Movement, in terms of uh, showing the things that are, you know, they're working on climate change, like the difference in climate went from, you know, it's 80 degrees in uh, seven days. So showing this is like something that they're working on and like what they're doing and why it's important, that's their quest. They're, they're trying to affect climate change and making, helping to get the youth involved. And it's just a really uh, interesting and striking visual to go along with this. Um, one thing I would also like to note that is not involved in the, the slides I said, but I also saw in the chat is like when 
people are asking a lot about their stories when they don't seem visual or you're working with vulnerable populations. Um, that's a very, um, you know, it's a lot of the things that I work on is like how to visualize uh, things that don't seem visual. You know, always consider your infographics, your data visualizations, other ways to do it. But also, as someone else mentioned, there are always other parts of the story that may not include your direct subject. Um, you know, as it, someone has said about mental health, but the people involved with that, the people who, the family members, the people who work at the facilities, the people in the community. So there's always a story out there, even if it's not the exact subject that is in your, um, you know, that you're trying to focus on. So just kind of like think a little bit broader in terms of that. And so I think that's my last slide. Um, and uh, thank you guys so much. You can find me um, at this. This is my information. I also have on Facebook and LinkedIn, um, Master Visual Storytelling Group. So if people are interested in kind of being part of a community that can help just build tips and, you know, people uh, write about links that they think are interesting and just kind of helping each other grow as visual storytellers, please feel free to join. Um, and you'll just find it when you search for Master for Visual Storytelling. So um, yeah, that's, that's for me. Wow. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Tara, uh, Tara, you'll put your information in the chat room. Um, so we'll go to the Q&A. Lots of questions in the Q&A. Um, um, anonymous, different types of fundraiser impact how you report in, on your taxes. I guess this is for Shamika. And um, Shamika, do you want to answer that? Um, I know I have an answer, and I'm sure other people in here have an answer. You can start. You can start. <laughs> okay. So, um, so of course you have to report all your um, donations on your 990s. That's pretty much what they talk about. But yes, there are different types of fundraisers. For example, there's some fundraisers that they consider taxable, which is called unrelated business income tax. So you can Google that with the IRS, UBIT, unrelated business income tax. So it just depends. I would talk to your accountant. I can't give you any accountant advice. Talk to your accountant about what is taxable and what is non-taxable as far as your fundraising. But great question and so true. Um, Jackie says, can you review the ongoing services fundraising method again? Um, Shamika, uh, you want to look at that? And um, I don't know how long it'll take you to review it, but- uh, Just really quick. Um, what that really means is that you offer services inside of your organization but you do it at a cost. So that's pretty much what it is. It's not necessarily having a separate event or anything like that. You do this ongoing and people can go and sign up at their leisure for their convenience of a time. And you offer these services during set business hours, so to speak. Okay, great. Cheryl says in previous nonprofits I work with, we've had questions about the restrictions and expectation that one needs to meet if you're asking for funds for a specific program or activity, et cetera. How does one ask for funds in a specific way without having to worry about restricted funds limitations? Okay, so this goes back to the whole transparency side of things. Make sure that if you're asking for something, it's where you need it. It, that's just really what it boils down to. So if you need it across the board, then you want to focus on an area where it is for everything. So like given Tuesday, for instance, that is not a, a date. Um, that particular um, event, that crowdfunding is not specified for a certain type of activity. So you can use it for whatever you need it for. So you just want to be clear on that. So it doesn't mean that it you are restricted from having to say that you're using it towards other things. It could potentially go to administrative costs, but you have to find a way to communicate that so people are clear that that's what it's going towards. And you can kind of outline, we're asking for administrative costs because this is what it costs us and this is what it takes. So you just want to be clear on that. Okay. Um, how do you handle crowdfunding, crowdfunding supporters who wish to receive a tax receipt? Do you state it up front and any best practice or suggestions? 
Sure. So I recommend utilizing um, a platform that does that for you. So many of them do. Um, it's a matter of turning on the service. So just look to see if there is an option there where it allows for them to have the receipt. You can already have your EIN number um, listed on the actual receipt confirmation information so that they can utilize that because all of them supply some type of receipt typically. So you just want to kind of do it from that aspect. But if you're you're utilizing something like a Facebook, um, just go ahead and pull their information where you're collecting a contact information so you can send that back to them in case you're a little bit nervous that it didn't send it. Great. And someone wants to know, would you recommend Facebook fundraising? So I would recommend having access to it. I wouldn't necessarily as a key factor, but I would recommend it having access to it because campaigns such as Giving Tuesday are already set up. It's easy for you to just kind of jump in on that. Many times they have some level of matching that they do for Facebook, as well as you are um, able to participate in things like that peer-to-peer -peer campaign. You may have seen people do, for my birthday, I would love for you to support this organization. That's essentially what it is. So if you're participating, you can do that as well, but there is a delay in how quick you can receive the funds. Okay, um, I will be sending the video out um, in 48 hours to everybody who's registered. If you did not register, you may have got the link. Some people have already inboxed me and said they got the link. Then you can catch this on our TechSoup YouTube channel. If not, you can email me at asimons at techsoup.org. Asimons at techsoup.org. Um, Caitlin said, is there, Kathy, excuse me, is there a best month or time in the year to host a fundraiser? Very good question. No, it is what works best for your organization. So if you're staying true to what you guys are doing and what makes sense for your organization, you want to do something around that date. We're in October. This is a huge breast cancer awareness month. This is prime time for you to do something around that. So you want to kind of go in line with what makes sense. If you have come up with some type of theme-based event or campaign, then you want to kind of go with something that makes sense for that. Having a masquerade ball may make more sense around Fat Tuesday. So just kind of go along with what you're doing and ride the wave of that time frame. Great. Um, um, someone anonymous said, what are your thoughts on matching gifts? Is it appropriate to say that we'll match up to $5,000 if the donor who's providing the matching grant is going to donate the whole $5,000, even if we only raise $3,000, for example? I think it's important to just be clear about what you're trying to communicate. And you don't have to communicate everything. And I am saying being transparent, but that doesn't mean tell all your business. So, so what that may look like is your donor may have said if they're able to, if you're able to raise $3,000 then that's the amount that you want to let everybody know that that is the goal that you're looking to make. And you don't have to say all of the other information, but if you do, there's ways that you can say that. I don't know many people that would be upset that if I gave you $3,000 that you may potentially get 5,000 from, you know, a donor. So just still be clear about what that is, but it's about the wording of how you actually say it. Yeah. Another way to also say it, you you, you, you don't have to say dollar for dollar because your volunteer hour is worth $27.20. .20. So you could say match either by dollar or volunteer hours. So that's something you could consider as well. There are questions in the chat room. If you all could also look in the chat room as well. Um, Tara, there's a question in there from Anita. Um, what are your thoughts? So I, we answered that one. I understand the reasoning behind specific, the specificity in fundraising goals. What if you don't have many supporters? I get it. For example, setting a an even setting even a five thousand dollar goal with no supporters feels challenging. Very good question, Megan. It is a good question. And so I actually challenge you to not worry about fundraising if that's the case. And I know that sounds crazy to a lot of nonprofits because that's one of the first things they try to go out and do, but no one knows you. They're not familiar with you. They don't know what you're going to do with their money. You give money to people you trust. So 
show something that you have done in the community for them to build that trust. Um, I've been a part of a couple of situations that have been like that. Um, I will tell you, I'm a co-founder of a nonprofit organization. And the first thing we did is actually set out to do a huge um, uh, school supply give back. And it was during the time that COVID was hitting hard and our community was actually the epicenter um, at that particular time for COVID. And so in that case, we just set out to do it. We didn't ask for any individual dollars per se. If somebody wanted to donate some, that was great, but we gave them other methods to help us. We were like, could you please donate in kind? These are the supplies that we're looking to provide. And we actually recorded that entire process. They saw what we were able to give back to the community after that event, at that point, we weren't even a nonprofit organization. We received a ton of um, different donations because people saw what we did with that. And then from there, you have something to stand on. You have some storytelling you can actually do and just kind of go from there, but concentrate on serving first and then asking for the money. Great. Speaking of storytelling, Felicia asked for video storytelling. What sort of Minimum budget should we plan for, Kara? I need it. Um, it really depends on like what you're looking for in terms of time. Um, you can do a lot for um, not very much in terms of like, you know, if you're looking for uh, social media, you're 30 seconds at, you know, maximum or um, you know, depending on you know, like, let's say Instagram stories or, um, you know, these kind of things. But if you're, you know, you, I think the first thing that you have to do is figure out like the type of story that you really want to tell and like how long your audience is really going to engage for. Um, and then, you know, a two to three uh, minute video, it also depends on, you know, the expenses, how much travel is involved, these kind of things. Um, but it can range anywhere from a couple of thousand to tens of thousands. So it's really about, um, you know, there's a lot that we get on a shoestring budget, um, but you just have to be very clear about what you want. And there's, I've seen some beautiful videos that are done, you know, without budget. Um, and it's, you just really have to hone in first on what your who your audience is and what your goal is for the video and on what platform you want to really focus on. And that will really help you kind of decide where to put your uh, resources. Okay, um, Tara and Shamika, I'm gonna ask both of you to go into the Q&A session and answer some questions just by typing the answer while we multitask and I will ask you um, live questions as well. So Brenda asked Tara, how long does a video have to be for social media and website purposes? Yeah, um, so it, it really, like if you're doing like a teaser, I mean, it can be anywhere from 15 seconds. I wouldn't go, I would not go lower, uh, higher than three minutes um, on most of them. And YouTube is now, you can see like much longer videos that are doing well, but on most of the platforms like Facebook and uh, Instagram and, you know, TikTok, they, the, two minutes is like a, a very good length and you really have those first 10 seconds to capture your audience's attention. So you really need to make sure that you are really um, getting a good visual, something that's gonna pull them in and then have them you know, want to watch the rest of it. So just keeping that in mind that, you know, I've seen so many organizations that put this amazing story like at minute, you know, one or two, and no one is going to get there if the first minute is kind of the lead up and doesn't tell you what you're getting to. So, you know, you have to think about how you can take a little piece of that very interesting nugget and put it at the beginning so that they follow the whole thing. Okay. We have one question that's um, written completely in Spanish, and I do not want to ignore this um, question. I don't know, Tara, do you speak Spanish? I just I just put it in the in, in the chat. Great. Um, do you see it? I just put it in the chat as well. I see it. Um, um. 
I, I, I wish I had time to mo I only have two hands. Google Translate, I, I can't, <laughs> I wish I could go to Google Translate. But yes, if somebody speaks Spanish, if you could type that in there. Um, uh, and I'm going to just um, continue with one more question. Um, should, you, what are you suggesting on jumpstarting a stall campaign? Oh, they're just saying hi. Hola. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying hello. Thank you, um, Aunt Amy. Okay. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions in Q&A. You do have, put your contact information in the, in the um, chat section again, ladies, and they can reach out to you personally. Um, when you close this link, there's going to be a a survey that'll pop up. Again, we're gonna email you this video replay within 48 hours. Um, and if you don't get the email, cause some of your emails, AOL and all those emails, they might go to a, a different box, but you'll get the video replay. If you don't find it in your email box, please go to our TechSoup YouTube channel. Make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, the, all the contact information for our speakers are there. Shamika. Thank you so much. Incredible, incredible, incredible. Tara, you are amazing. You are amazing. Thank you, Thank guys. you so, so much for being here. Tara, I'm going to say good night to you. And Shimika, I'm going to say good day <laughs> to you. And goodbye to all of our um, members here at ED Chat. Thank you all so very much for being here. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.